that poison, that deadly poison, that pink thing in your mouth. That pink thing in your mouth can kill somebody. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but your words, dear husband, will kill me. Let that sink in for a minute. That's why you have to reconcile yourself. Or darkness comes. You have to deal with yourself or you'll hurt people that you claim to love. And in some cases, you won't even know you hurt them. Trust me with your, with your forgiveness. Yeah. Yes. Live joyfully with the wife that you love every day until you die. For that is your main job in this life that you took while you lived on earth. So my lovely wife, she completed a great message already. It's already on YouTube. Uh, she, she dealt with the role of a woman and she dealt with how a wife is required and commanded by God to be subject to her husband. And all the husbands said amen. Now it's time to see if, if the husbands, it's time to see if men want to deal with the Bible commands men to do. She dealt with the pastors and their roles, their limited role in a woman's life. And all the men were happy. Let's see if those same men are happy today. We already know the Bible commands man to love his wife, right? We know that already, but we never consider why or how. Why does God have to give a commandment to a man to love his wife? Ephesians 5 verse 25, it says, husbands, love your wives. Got it, no problem. The challenge comes when the Bible commands us how. When the Bible commands us a way to love your wife, that's the issue. The scripture says, husbands, love your wives the same way Christ loved the church. The church is God's bride. It is his wife. And he died for her, for his wife. My question today is, at what point must a man be willing to die to protect his wife? I want y'all to remember this is my main question. At what point is a man, should a man be willing to die to protect his wife while they're dating? After they've been married for a while? How does a woman dating a man know that he can meet that requirement? To love your wife so much you're willing to give your life for her. How does she know that? When will she know that? When will she know that this is the guy that I can marry because he's willing to give his life for me? Most men, most real men, will go to war to protect their wife. That's easy. They'll go to war to protect their wife in an altercation. No problem. But what about killing that inner man that we men don't want to talk about? What about that battle within yourself? Are you willing to kill your lust so you don't cheat? Are you willing to kill your pride so you can make an exception for your wife? Are you willing to kill your anger so you don't take stuff out on your wife? What about killing that part of you that your wife can't abide? What about killing that part of you that your wife can't deal with? It says that we might sanctify. The husband is required to be the priest of the house. That's a commandment. Are you dating a guy? Or will you allow your daughters to yoke with a guy that can't fit the role of priest in the house to the point where he can keep the house sanctified? Are you dating a guy? Are you yoking with a guy? Are you considering a guy? Are you proving a guy that can't be the priest of the house? Do demons tremble when your husband's feet touch the floor in the morning? When your husband come home from work, when his feet touch the, the floor, do demons tremble? Men, it is your responsibility, yours, not to rule the house with a puffed up chest and say, look at me, I'm a man. Obey me. Are you able to usher in the spirit of God in your house? It's your house, right? Can you deny yourself so that your house is sanctified? You want the woman to, to clean the house, right? Be nice. A woman that can keep a clean house, that's good, right? But is your house clean with those nasty magazines? What about those spirits you're allowing in your house with those videos you're watching that you think God doesn't see? What about that liquor? You know, they used to call liquor spirits. 
Verse 26, and cleanse it. Who's the if? Your wife. With the washing of water by the word, the preached word, the holy scriptures, the word of God, the commandments, not your mouth, not your rules. How come every rule that the man has don't affect the man? It's always worse for the woman. You know, for verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy without blemish. We love talking about men that find a wife. But hey, women, are you picking a man that can do that? Are you picking a man or preparing your daughters to only accept a man that can present you to God and say, look, I've done everything in my power to keep my house sanctified, to keep my house holy, to keep my family holy. Verse 28, this is how men ought to love their wives, just like your own bodies. You thirsty? You think she not? You tired? You think she not? You want attention. You just don't know how to, how to ask for it because you get confused with sex. The Bible says, he that loveth his wife, loveth himself. Verse 29. Verse 29 is literally saying, if I went to your wife and I asked her, if I went to your girlfriend and I asked her, do you cherish her? Do, do, do your husband, do your, your, your partner cherish you? She should be able to say, yeah, joyfully. She should be able to joyfully say, yes, he loves me. All right. How is it possible? that two of the worst people in the world can live together for years, however many years you get. How is it possible that a rapist and a murderer can live together in a 60 foot square room, little small room with no amenities, but two people they claim they love each other? Why does God command men to love their wives? Why is that even a command? Why can a pimp and a child smuggler do what two God-fearing people struggle to do. You know why? Because there's mutual respect. There's rules and boundaries and consequences. When you take a position of power and control over a woman, you cease to love her. Because you can't do both. That's why men are commanded to love your wife. Because love will destroy that pride, that pride that makes you take an evil position of authority over God's precious vessel. Pride will make you say mean things and not apologize for it. I'm preaching to myself today. But, oh, Bubba, give me another name for it. Oh, Leroy, in bunk number two, he don't get treated like that, does he? You know why? Because you know when Bubba keeps his shank. But if you loved your wife, you'll know when you hurt her. The scriptures say, husbands, love your wife. We're on six. The Bible says, husbands, love your wife. Why doesn't the Bible tell the wife to love your husband? The scripture says to the wives, submit to your own husband. Your own husband. Or only your husband. What if the wife doesn't submit? If the wife doesn't submit to her husband, does the husband have to love her? What if the husband doesn't love his wife? If the husband doesn't love his wife, does the wife have to submit to him? Does the wife have to submit? What if the wife says, is it wrong if the wife says, you don't love me? I don't got to submit to you. Mark 10, verse 8. And the two shall be one flesh. When a couple gets married, God views them as one flesh. One person. If he's the same person you married, when exactly do you become one flesh? And whose flesh do you become? The man's, right? I ain't changing for nobody. She gonna be like me. It's gonna be my flesh. God expects you to become man's flesh? Or does God expect you to become a brand new combined flesh? One that works together. One that feels each other's pain. One that shares each other's goals and desires. Thank you. 
one that wins souls together, one that has fun every day and love each other. That's a whole new flesh set. Why do you think the sign God chose to prove he entered your body is taming that body part that no man can tame? You have to be full of the Holy Ghost to get rid of that unruly evil, that poison, that deadly poison, that pink thing in your mouth. That pink thing in your mouth can kill somebody. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but your words, dear husband, will kill me. Let that sink in for a minute. That's why you have to reconcile yourself. Or darkness comes. You have to deal with yourself or you'll hurt people that you claim to love. And in some cases, you won't even know you hurt them. Hey. You know, you know, God is a merciful God. But did he have mercy when he killed every living thing with a lung? Minus eight people. Was he merciful then? Well, actually, it was really four people. Because God wanted to replenish the earth. So uh, Noah's sons had to go get some wives. How is dr God drowning millions of people mercy? What about those four cities? Sodom, Gomorrah, and uh, I don't think the Bible lists the other two names of the other two. God killed a baby in the crib. He killed a dog in the kennel. He only saved one man and his two daughters because his wife looked back. Was that mercy? Was that going too far? What about the time God sent one angel to kill his own people? The Bible says, I think we Samuel. Second Samuel, it says, and when the angel stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, the angel killed 70 thousand people. God used an angel to kill 70,000 of his own people. The Lord, God Almighty, Jesus himself, he changed his mind of that evil and he said to the angel, that's enough. He told the angel, stop. And the angel stood up against the wall waiting for his next orders. King David messed up and God murdered his own people. But this time, unlike Noah, this time, unlike Lot, God said, that's enough. So God sent me today with this message to men. Before you go too far, stop. Next one. King David. Oh, King David. Y'all love King David, right? Slew Goliath and he did all that, but he be messing up. But God said, this is a man after my own heart. Why? I'm going to tell you why. When David saw the angel leaning up against the wall. Y'all like when my angel leaning against the wall? He didn't say anything to the angel. He went straight to the source. He laid the ax to the root. David said, uh, Lord, I messed up. I have sinned. The problem, Lord, is me. I need to be corrected. I've done wickedly. You see that? That's a righteous king. One that's not full of pride. One that can repent. One that can admit fault and say, I'm sorry. Why is it so hard for men to, to apologize? Why is, why is the word sorry so difficult for men? All right, here's number one. I think we got four exercises today. This is the first exercise. I want every real man, just the real man, to apologize to your wife or your girlfriend right now. That's what I need to do. Apologize to your wife or your girlfriend right now. I want you to tell her you're sorry for everything that you've done that made her unhappy. Wife, I'm sorry from the moment that we met for every single thing, every single thing I've said, every single thing I've done, everything I forgot. I deeply apologize to you for everything that I've ever done that made you unhappy. Sorry. I even got a, I see even blew a kiss with me. How nice. Oops. Try it. Say that to your wife. Do it. If you sit next to her, turn. If wife, if he's sitting next to you, sit, wait, turn, face him, go ahead. Tell your wife you're sorry. Everything you see, it's not that hard. It's not that hard. David didn't send somebody else to deal with the problem. You know why? Because he's a real man. He went to God himself. David said, God, I'm sorry. Let your bride, let her slide. I beg you. It is here you see David doing what a husband should do. What every good husband should do. He covered Every good husband should cover his wife. Every good husband should protect his wife. Every good husband should sanctify his wife and even stand up to God for his wife. Unlike old coward Adam. 
Blame everything on E. Because he's a coward. That's what real men do. Real men fix problems and they don't blame nobody. David said, God, be against me. Are you willing to die for your life? Are you willing to lay down your, your life for your wife? I'm not, I'm not talking about your flesh. I'm talking about your bad spirit. Kill it. I'm talking about your evil tongue. Kill it. Go to God and say, it's me, oh God. It's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Fix me, God. Take out the stuff that's not like you. I have to battle with myself. And I'm going to begin this journey battling with myself. Help me, God. Make me better, Lord. Make me a better person, God. Teach me how to talk to my wife. Teach me how to be gentle and sensitive and understanding. Teach me, God, to have an ear for her when she don't even have to say anything. I'll just know what she needs. Teach me, God, how to repent and be sorrowful every day and have a repentful heart like David and know when I mess up, what did David do? Immediately, he didn't wait. What did he? See, David's mistake, his proud spirit, that, that angel killed 70,000 people, y'all. And here you see God saying, I'm not going to go past that limit. That's enough. That's enough. Okay. God said, that's my limit. What's your limit? How far are you willing to go? How many times have you already hurt your wife since you've been with her? Your girlfriend before you even get married. How many times have you hurt her? Seven? Seventy? Seven hundred? What's your limit? How many times should she take? How much should she put up with? Why did David wait until God killed 70,000? Why didn't he go after 10? Why didn't he go after one? Why don't you do something today? What's your limit? Here's exercise number two. I want you to write down three things. You too. You in my class too. I want you to write down three things. I'm going to do it too. That you will never do. Here's an opportunity for you to declare your limit. I'm never going to go past this point. I'm never going to do this or I'm never going to do that. And this should be easy. Every man should start off with I'm never going to hit you. All right, so go to your notes. Write it down in your notes. Mm -hmm. Go on your notes. I want you to write down concerning your wife, your girlfriend. I want you to write down girlfriends concerning your husband. Write down three things that you'll never do. I just gave you one. Easy. So you can't use that one. I'll never raise my voice at you. How about that? That's two. I'm talking to you. I don't have, I don't have a pen to write that. I'll never hit you. I'll never raise my voice with you. And I'll never cheat on you. That's three. I, I, I should have said five. Because three is too easy. If, hey, if y'all really love your wife, go to five. Three is too easy. I'll never walk out on you and go get a pack of cigarettes. I don't even smoke. Go get milk. I'll never leave you and go get the milk. What they gonna get now? Get the milk. Come on, it's time to declare your, your, declare your limit. Say how far you won't go. Even God, did you see what I did here? I showed you that God Almighty, he's, he can do whatever he wants. He's sovereign. He can kill everybody if he wants to. He, and he's done it. He killed almost everybody before, but he's showing you, I have a limit. You should have a limit. You should have a, a threshold that you won't cross. You won't go past. Amos or Amos 519. I want y'all to catch this. this. This is the revelation. If you ran from a lion and ran into a bear, or you ran into the house and leaned your hand on a wall and a snake bit you. So you have to deal with yourself. You can try to mask it, you can try to cover it up, but if you don't deal with the lion, then I wish you peace with the bear. If you prevail with the bear, just when you think everything is lovely, and try to relax, enjoy your time with King Cobra. Or, you can set boundaries, you can set limits, and don't allow your own wife to be your victim. So you have to deal with your inner man, and everybody has to reconcile with their childhood. You have to make peace with your past. You have to make peace with your past. You have to forgive yourself for your mistakes, or you can ignore them. Pretend they don't exist. Act like it don't matter. 
and then you'll run into a bear. And even if you get away from the bear this week, next month, next year, you better have some anti-venom for that snake bite. Did you know a snake can squeeze you to death? You don't have to have venom. How you antidote gonna help with that? So, Revelation 2.5. The Bible says, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. Remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the first words or else I'm going to come unto you quickly and remove that candlestick out of his place except you repent. So today is the day to change. God is talking to his backslidden bride here. He's talking to his backslidden wife and he's giving her a space to repent. How nice. But notice what he said. He said, remember from when you messed up. Go figure out where you messed up and fix it. You fix it. Don't blame anybody. Don't say it was the woman you gave me. He said, do your first work. What did you do to get that woman? You remember what you did? And how sweet you talked to her when you first met? God said, go back to that. God said, I'm commanding you to love your wife. 13. When you, met, when you marry somebody, this is what young people don't, don't understand. When, when a young person say they want to get married, I cringe. You really know what you're doing? Do you understand, do you understand what marriage is, biblical marriage? Because when you marry somebody, you're marrying their spirits. When you marry somebody, you're marrying their demons. When you marry somebody, you're marrying their past. You're marrying their problems. You're marrying the things that hurt them. The, you, you're marrying their memories. You're marrying their nightmares. You're marrying all of that. You, it, you, you are entering into a contract with all of that. You got to deal with that. And they got to deal with you. They got to deal with your stuff. See, you got a, 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 a problem that you have to deal with. You say she got a lying spirit, but you got a lustful spirit. You say she got a vanity spirit, but you got an angry spirit. No, she, she got a gossiping spirit. You got a controlling spirit. Watch out. Here comes a lion. Watch out. Here comes a lion. Woo! That was close. Look out! Here comes a bear. Woo! That was close. You made it safely to the house. Dang it, there's a snake. See what happens if you don't deal with the inner you? Joshua 25, no, I'm sorry, 24, 15. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, make a choice today. Choose you this day who you're going to serve. Well, God commands you to love your wife the same way he loves his church. The scripture says, but as for me and my house, we will, and this is your third assignment today. Fill in that blank. It's your third assignment. As for me and my house, we will what? Hey, man in the house, I don't want, I don't want you to put what the Bible says. I want you to put your own thing there. I want you to fill in the blank for your house. And you can't put what the scripture says because that's cheating. Come up with your own rule. As for me and my house, there will be peace here. As for me and my house, there will be tranquility here. As for me and my house, this house will be holy. As for me and my house, we're not allowing the worldliness here. I want you to, this is the third exercise, put it in your notes or write it down on your piece of paper. I want you to write down that one thing that you will make a standard in your house. You're the man in the house, right? Now, ask your wife, what does she want that thing to be? You see how that works? What do you want that thing? You mind sharing? As for me and my house, we will be holy and happy. As for me and my house, she said we will be holy and happy. I agree with that. That's what we're going to do. We're going to roll like that. We're going to be holy in this house, and we're going to be happy in this house. I'm the man in the house. I'm going to make sure that happens. And you see how I invited my wife into that? All right. Because we're one flesh. See? And we're working together. We're going to work on that together. 2 Samuel 24, 12. God said, okay, David, you repented. Now you're ready to deal with your own self, okay? Now you're ready to face your childhood trauma and get some help. Because of that, David, because you did the right thing and you came and repented, I'm going to offer you three things. And you can choose one of those three things and I'm going to give it to you, whatever it is. Ain't that nice? You're supposed to be one flesh, right? And you can't, you don't hate your own flesh. You cherish it, right? Now cherish your wife. Feel her pain and know what parts of her that hurt. 
So this is what assignment is this one at? This is four. This is the fourth assignment. I want you to list three things. Three things. Three things that you like about your partner. Your partner, your wife, your husband, your spouse, your husband. Okay. And I want you to, after you put the three things that you like about them, or her, I want you to write three things that you're going to offer her, him. See how nice God is? God comes in and he realizes, I'm not going to go that far. This is God. He can do what he wants. David repented and God says, okay, you ready to deal with yourself? You realize you're the problem? You're not blaming anybody? You ready to fix it? You ready to move forward? You, you would rather me give you the punishment and the judgment rather than your wife? That's a good heart. So I'm going to give you something. I'm going to give you what you want. So I want husbands and wives to do that with me today. This is not a church. This is not Friday night service. This is an interactive class, so I need you all to participate with this. I want you to write down three things that you're going to offer your partner. Three things you like about your, your partner and three things that you are going to offer your partner. Three, 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 seven. All right, it says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. The Bible says she's the weaker vessel. You don't have to show her you don't do the big bad brute and you have to win every argument and you have to uh, use your brute force. The Bible says she's the weaker we know that. She knows that. Why don't you know that? You don't have to prove that. You don't have to win every argument. You don't have to walk away from her. She's talking to you. And as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Ooh. The Bible says if you don't honor your wife, don't pray. You're wasting your time. Love your wife. Honor your wife so that God will hear your prayers. That's my message today. Because there's something that's, there's, something that's coming down the pipe. Something's going to happen and you're going to need God. Why have your prayers hindered? You're the priest of that house. You're the priest of a house that God doesn't hear. God doesn't hear you because you don't honor your wife. How in the world are you going to sanctify your wife? How in the world are you going to sanctify your house with hindered prayers? Dude, how are you going to lead your wife? How are you going to lead your family if your prayers are hindered? You got to deal with yourself. You got to deal with yourself. You got to fight. You have to deal with it first. You should have dealt with it before you got married. But now that you're married, you have to deal with your own self. You have to start that battle within your own self. Because your prayers aren't hindered. So that God will give you favor. Thank y'all for coming. I really appreciate y'all. We're here to help. Our ministry is aligned to help you. We want to see God's people saved. We want to see God's people delivered. We want to see God's people set free. We want God's people to know the truth. And we need y'all help. We don't need y'all help with money. I'm never going to ever going to stand here and beg for money. I'm never going to stand here and ask for money. I am going to ask that you share the videos. Unlike this one, so you can't share it. I am going to ask that you guys support me on Fridays at 7 and Tuesdays at 7. If Tuesdays at 7 don't work for you, I'll move it for you. I'll move it to Wednesday. We have diaspora teaching on Wednesday, uh, or Tuesday, I'm sorry, at 7 o'clock. And we do have this also. And whatever else we need, I mean, whatever else you need, we're here to help you. We have, we have resources that you don't even know yet. And if you go to our website, covenantservants.com, you'll notice that there's no tithes paid there. Keep your tithes. Take care of your family with it. Take your wife out to dinner. What we need your help with is pre presenting these slides, sending these slides to people, trying to get God's people saved. That's all I want to do. And, and, and we invest our own money into this. I don't, I don't even want to know the thousands that we spent just this year. They didn't say hundred. Thousands that we spent this year out of our own pocket because we don't, we're not monetized on YouTube. We don't get a dime. But all we're trying to do is help God's people. We're trying to reach the lost at any cost. I don't care what it costs. If I can bring a soul in, got it. Great. I love reading the comments when somebody wants to give their life to God. That gives me purpose. That means I'm doing this for a reason. You can be a part of that. One day, God is going to lead somebody to walk down the altar. Walk down the aisle to the altar. One day, God will lead somebody to one of our videos. That one person will be the last person. 
Somebody's going to be the last person. Somebody has to be the last person. When that last person gives their life to God, when that last person gets filled with the Holy Ghost, and God comes back, I want to be a part of that. At least that last person, if I haven't been a part of anybody. You can be a part of that last person. We don't know who it's going to be. It could be the very person, the next person that subscribes to the channel. You can be a part of that. We need your help. Go ahead and consider being a covenant servant. If there's any questions, if there's any comments, if there's anything you want to see or talk about, you can uh, let me know right now. We have an esteemed Arthur. He does have a marriage ministry. I appreciate him. We should be working together. I have other people I'm working together with. I have a uh, rape advocate that I'm working with. If you if we need that help, we have resources for shelters. We have resources for abuse victims. We have even private detectives on deck to help out. <laughs> What's going on, man? What's happening? Oh, um, everything was great, man. I enjoyed it. Uh, it talked about a lot of stuff that us men need to uh, step up and do in the household, man. Uh, being the priest of our homes and everything, because I know it's a lot of guys that I talk to they really don't know that aspect of it and they always do the controlling aspect of it where they try to control everything like you were saying they got a controlling spirit but she lies and stuff like that so that's that's a much needed thing that's going on as far as our book me and my wife wrote a book uh what was it i think we put it out at the beginning of this year um it's called god love and great sex check it out it's on amazon you can get it on the kindle version um or you can just order the paperback what? It's called God, God, Love, and Great Six. Woo! <laughs> those are the those are the top three co components to a, a marriage. You know, a lot of yeah, a lot man. of times that happens. Amen. You know, because if you don't, I mean, if you don't have the companionship with someone, or or like like you were saying, like how can two prisoners stay together and two married people two christians can't you know you got to have that love with each other you got to have that companionship with each other you got to be able to have a friendship you be able to talk to each other when when it's needed even when it's hurtful you got to talk to them still because they can still offer you some good advice whether you want to listen to it or not it'll still be some sound advice and you have to sometimes just go into your little quiet place and pray and ask god like hey man you know she was, she was real harsh on me, but, you know, it was the truth. It was something that you needed. It, she's there to help develop you in, in any aspect. She's there to help make you a better person. Right. A lot of, yeah, because a lot of times you are, uh, you're, you're being an argument or anything. You, you like, I'm right. And it's, it's pride. And, you know, a lot of times it's, it's hard for you to say, well, I was wrong in that, in the, you know, in the heat of the moment. But sometimes when you go back and think and everything calm down, you should go back and like you were saying, apologize for everything that you had been doing. Why is it so hard for men to say sorry? Why is it so hard for us to apologize? Right? What is I, I don't have a problem with it. I don't have a problem with it. I, I've learned. Um, just come on out and it's like so much easier. Be right or be happy. Because you can be right, but would you rather have a happy marriage? And and, and, then, and then a lot of times, uh, men and women, they both do stuff in condescending ways. Like you might be, yeah, okay, you're right. Okay, whatever. No, you have to actually honestly and wholeheartedly and genuinely say that you're right and understand where they're coming from because it's a, it's their viewpoint. You can't control their viewpoint. All right, give me, give me the name of your book one more time. Uh, God, Love, and Great Sex. It gone. also has a, a little journal on there to go with it. It's a blank journal. It's nothing in it. It's just for you to take notes on your journey as you read the book and go through everything. If you want to jot some notes down or like tonight, the questions that he asked, if you got questions that you want to ask your partner, you can write them down in there. Thoughts that come in your head while you're reading the book, you can do that also. Gracious to you, your turn is faced for you and me. Thank you.